Good evening. Salvation is determined by how we treat our neighbors, especially the poor. Our entire globe is our neighbor without geographical boundaries. As Jesus came not to establish parishes, but a worldly kingdom of God. Before we begin, let us silently pray for the grace of generosity. All that you have done to us, O Lord, you have done with true judgment, for we have sinned against you and not obeyed your commandments. But give glory to your name and deal with us, deal with us according to the bounty of your mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us call to mind our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God of mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life.
let us pray. O God, who manifest your almighty power above all by pardoning and showing mercy, bestow, we pray, your grace abundantly upon us, and make those hastening to attain your promises heirs to the treasures of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, Woe to the complacent in Zion, lying upon beds of ivory, stretched comfortably on their couches. They eat lambs taken from the flock and calves from the stall. Improvising to the music of the harp, like David, they devise their own accompaniment. They drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils. Yet. They are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Therefore, now they shall be the first to go into exile, and their wanton revelry shall be done away with. The word of the Lord. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. But you, man of God, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the noble confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you before God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who gave testimony under Pontius Pilate for the noble confession, to keep the commandment 
without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the blessed and only ruler will make manifest at the proper time, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, and whom no human being has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, there was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours, or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Perhaps sometimes when we find ourselves speaking to people who have perhaps fallen away or kind of made that gentle drift into apostasy, we come across the objection that uh, hell seems kind of rough. Like, I don't see how a loving God could send someone to eternal torment in flames. That doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. Especially when we look at this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So for all we know, the rich man, he seems like he's overall a pretty decent guy. He loves his family, and even in the midst of his torment, he is concerned for the well-being of his brothers. Never mind that even the pagans love those who love them. But 
his riches, he could have come by them honestly as well. And it's not like he's killed anyone or robbed any banks or anything like that. He seems like he's a so-called good person. Yeah, maybe he's, he's a bit of a foodie. He'd probably be definitely tuning into PBS Create religiously if he were around now. Yeah, maybe he gets a little carried away, like every day with some of that stuff. And maybe avocado toast and mimosas every day is a little too much, but is it, is it really that bad? For eternal flames and torment? Like that bad? And maybe he's even trying to be a good person. Maybe he's trying to use his money to do good. Maybe he is trying to be philanthropic. Maybe he's off to some meeting or maybe his dinners are gatherings of other rich people so they can make their plans to fix all of the world's problems and save the world by the year 50. And sure, maybe he could do more, but who among us couldn't do more? And really, do we expect such an imperson, impor, impor, important person like him to be slowed down by just one poor person who's practically already dead anyway? Like, imagine how much good he could be doing by not wasting his time on Lazarus, who's not long for this world anyway. Why should a good person like that rich man be in hell? So how is that for an objection against God? But the answer is that he's in hell because he never left. When we think of what our basic condition is, like, yes, God made the world good. He gets to the end of each day of creation and he declares it good. He gets to the end of the day when he creates us and he declares that it is very good. But nevertheless, ever since the fall, the world has been subjected to the enemy, the one whom our Lord at the Last Supper in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, verse 30, refers to as the ruler of this world. Yes. The world has been ruled over ever since the fall as a province of hell. That is our basic condition. That the goodness of the world, it has not been completely crushed yet, nor erased, but the, dec the decay is there. The goodness crumbles when it departs from God. And that is our default condition, that we are trapped in that mindset of selfishness that sets in after the fall, that sees the way that all of the world can be arrayed against us to hurt us and to exploit us and to absolutely break us. And we say, I want nothing to do with that. So I will build those walls to defend myself against harm. I will get my own. I will get what I deserve. I will achieve my will. I will live my best life by my definition. I will do it my way. We can even see that selfishness even in the youngest of children. There's uh, maybe a month or so ago and before the beginning of the school year, I was able to visit a family for a party and there were a couple of young children that were just barely able to walk. And one of them was at one of the water table things and had one of those little water toys. The other one was like stumbling after him, trying to take it from him. And he's like trying to stumble away from him. It's like a slow speed chase in slow motion practically. But you can see concupiscence at play. It's like, I see that and I want it and I'm going to take it from you. And the other kid's like, no, like trying to whack her away. <laughs> we can see concupiscence even from the very beginning. It is our default condition. And when we give in to that mentality, it is something that hardens ourselves against the sufferings of others and makes us absolutely blind to it, so long as my will is done. It is that default condition which, see the way that C.S. Lewis kind of puts it, the gates of hell are locked from the inside and sometimes they're barred with super heavy bars like we're in a fortress. Other times it's closed with that simple lock of the bathroom door, but nevertheless, it's closed from the inside, whether it be for large reasons or for small reasons. But it is our Lord, he is the one who comes to fight for us. He comes to take his world back, and he is the one who promised that he will establish his church and that the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. So the question becomes, why does the rich man stay? in that province of hell. That is 
the word of God that sets us free. Our Lord himself, chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, he tells us that if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the rich man and his brothers, they are those of whom our Lord speaks in the parable of the sower when he says that the good seed of the word falls among the thorns of worldly anxieties and of the lure of riches, and it chokes off the life of the good word of God so that it bears no fruit. The rich man and his brothers, they are too occupied with their feasts and with their own affairs to pay any attention to Moses or to the prophets or even to one who rises from the dead. So they are blind also to the suffering of Lazarus at their door. And perhaps we see that mentality at play. Like, come on, it's the year 32 AD. Like, should we really be living according to these, like, old stories and myths from the year 1500 BC? Like, we have Roman aqueducts now. Look at all the things that we have that they didn't have back then. So in the end, it is, even though that the door is open, and Jesus is standing there saying to us, like, come with me if you want to live, type of thing. Like, you got Arnold Schwarzenegger there, like, come on, come with me. He's saying that to the rich man, which, in the end, he's saying this parable to the Pharisees, to the ones to whom he had just given his teaching that you cannot serve both God and mammon, and they, because they have a love of money, they sneer at his teachings and reject him. Instead, they cannot be bothered to pass through that narrow way. And instead they choose the easy way of selfish indulgence and of indifference. And their love of humanity remains only abstract to completely melt away like fog in the sun when it comes into contact with a real person, when it comes into contact with the suffering of Lazarus. It's gone, just like that. So what are we to do then? Where do we find our hope? We find our hope in the word of God. We don't have to worry about saving the entire world. That's not our job. That's Jesus' job. We don't have to take that weight upon us. Instead, what is for us to do is to love those persons who are set before us and to love them even when it is difficult and to love them with all that we have. We stay rooted and the love of God who is the word made flesh in his teachings. And that word will become flesh in us. It will take root in our souls and it will produce fruit if we remain in his word. Because when we remain in his word, we will truly be his disciples and we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. we rise to profess our faith in the living God. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father for all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in the Holy Catholic and 
Apostolic Church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And trusting in the goodness and mercy of God our Heavenly Father, we bring before him our prayers and our petitions. That all who preach the gospel may, like Amos, challenge the complacent and self-centered and call them to a life of self-sacrifice, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the leaders in our country realize that poor and those in need of assistance and compassion are children of God and not pawns to be used for political gain, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that young and old living in this materialistic culture may find real spiritual fulfillment and true joy in Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those lonely or without hope, may they be consoled by the gentle spirit of Jesus who strengthens us with his love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have gone before us, especially Dorothy Smith, May they be welcomed into the joy of the kingdom of heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Most merciful Father, we entrust these prayers to you, and we entrust them through the intercession of the glorious Prince of your heavenly hosts as we pray. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.
Great brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O merciful God, that this our offering may find acceptance with you, and that through it the wellspring of all blessing may be laid open before us, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder. To rule in your name over all you have made, and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so, with, as with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we hear claim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly through your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Donald, our Bishop, and all those who hold him to the truth and on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise that they offered for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a 
a similar way when supper was ended. He took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. For O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we are servants and your holy people, offered to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us. This pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest, Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us, who through this participation at the altar, Receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith, and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless also your servants for those sinners. Open your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share in the fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, to whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say,
Hear for us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. By this we came to know the love of God, that Christ laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for one another.
let us pray. May this heavenly mystery, O Lord, restore us in mind and body, that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ, to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The script will be available for sale in the back after Mass. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth the Masses and...